All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for spending your afternoon with us here um, to talk about a really important issue. I know we're all um, eagerly thinking about the November elections and the critical importance of uh, voting this year and wanted to highlight and share some opportunities to be supportive of transit um, across the, the three states that comprise the, um, the west coast of, of what is now called the United States of America. Uh, thank you for all of our partner organizations up and down the coast that are uh, partnering with us to get the word out about this transit chat, Friends of Caltrain, uh, getting there together, Opal, Seattle Neighborhood Greenway, Seattle Transit Writers Union, and Verde. Um, be sure to check out this work. We talk a lot about the national movement for building power for transit. And these are the folks who are really leading the way and making it happen. I am Alex Hudson. I am the Executive Director of uh, Transportation Choices Coalition. And I am really glad to have you all here today. TCC is a statewide advocacy and policy organization based in Seattle, Washington that works across the state of Washington to uh, create more and better opportunities for people to uh, take transit and other forms of transportation. We're gonna start today with a moment to acknowledge that while we are all gathering virtually, our panel is joining us from the ancestral lands of the Cowlitz, Clackama, Multnomah, Cascades, Kawala, um, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Molala, and additional bands of Chinook people and their descendants, as well as the Rimatush, Ohlone, and Coast Salish people, specifically the Duwamish people. Indigenous people are still here and many of whom are fighting for federal recognition. Mobility for all cannot be achieved without recognizing and honoring those that first navigated these spaces. As we work towards building a more accessible world, let us be mindful that we do so on stolen land. Today, we honor with gratitude the physical spaces which we occupy and the native communities past, present, and future who live and thrive here. We also need to acknowledge the senseless deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Elijah McClain, Dion Kizzy, and other Black Americans and recognize the injustice of their lost lives as part of a deep and shameful history of anti-Black violence and white supremacy in the United States. Racism, police violence, and structural inequality are also transportation problems. And as transportation advocates, planners, engineers, policy and decision makers, we must take an anti-racist approach to our work. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we will be taking questions in the chat, so you can drop those in uh, in the chat below. This event will be recorded and a video will be sent out and available on TCC's websites. And uh, captions are available uh, if you select the captions options at the bottom of your screen here. So I'd like to introduce our panelists. Have, uh, we have with us Adina Levin. She's the executive director of Friends of Caltrain, a nonprofit grassroots advocacy organization supporting stable funding and successful modernization of, the, of Caltrain in the Bay Area. Adina is also the advocacy director at Seamless Bay Area, which is a nonprofit whose mission is to create an integrated and unified world-class public transportation network in the Bay Area. Juan Carlos Gonzalez is a lifelong Oregonian and the Oregon Metro Counselor representing District 4, uh, which includes areas of Northern and Western Washington County. Juan Carlos is a, um, as I mentioned, is a lifelong Oregonian whose priorities include advancing racial justice in land use planning, transportation investments, taking action on climate change and affordable housing policies. Kelsey Mesher uh, is the Advocacy Director at Transportation Choices Coalition. She leads TCC's work in building strong coalitions and support among elected officials, transportation leaders, and the public for equitable transportation policies and practices. Prior to joining us at TCC, Kelsey worked as a bicycle advocate, launching campaigns and organizing efforts for safe and protected places to bike in Seattle. 
So I'm going to turn it over to all of you and give you an opportunity to take a couple of minutes and tell us about your transit measure, what it is, what it does. Uh, it's on the balance for folks in November right now. Um, tell us a little about it. And Adina, we're going to start in California and turn it over to you. All right. Uh, yeah, well, um, uh, thanks to everyone for uh, coming virtually. I'm really looking forward to this conversation and learning more about the other ballot measures and the uh, local advocacy and, you know, how uh, we might be able to work together in the future. Um, so uh, uh, as you, you said in the bio, uh, Friends of Caltrain's focus um, has been stable funding and successful modernization of uh, Caltrain service in the context of a regionally um, coordinated public transportation system that is accessible to all. Um, uh, Caltrain, which is the rail line that connects San Francisco through San Jose, the west side of the Bay, um, has never had stable funding since the line was taken over from the state by the three county agency partners that took it over in the mid 90s. Um, so before COVID, um, Caltrain got 70% of its revenue from fares, which is good. There's a good argument to me that that's just too much, and which we'll get to in when we discuss equity and the remaining 30% um, from the three county transit agency partners. Um, with COVID and a lot of businesses being required to be closed, ridership is all the way down, fares are down, three county partners are struggling, and Caltrain risks getting shut down. Um, unless Measure RR passes. Um, it was, but Measure RR wasn't created for COVID. It had been in the works. There was a law that was passed in 2017, um, SB 797, that provided for a one eighth cent uh, uh, sales tax um, to provide funding for Caltrain. And that is what is on the ballot uh, today. Um, we are not thrilled about a sales tax, which was regressive, which we'll talk about later. Um, but it also funds some really um, important uh, equity measures to make the service more accessible uh, to more people uh, going forward. And I'll say one more thing about the campaign that we'll talk about later, which is that uh, Friends of Caltrain is working with bicycle coalitions and housing organizations and um, other nonprofits to be the grassroots arm of the campaign doing phone banking and the text banking and those activities, direct voter outreach that will be the margin of victory. Uh, every day, I'm on mute. <laughs> Juan Carlos in Oregon, uh, in, the, in the Portland area, tell us about uh, your campaign. Thank you, Alex, and hi, everyone. Buenas tardes. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, my name is Juan Carlos, uh, and I'm a very uh, proud elected official here in the Portland metro area. Uh, I'm excited to talk about Let's Get Moving 2020, uh, which is our regional transportation measure that's on the November ballot. Um, and if at any point you want to learn more, you could always go to letsgetmoving2020.com, and you can find out uh, a bunch of really great work that uh, that has that has built to the, has been built for this moment. Um, our our measure was built over two years uh, by over 35 task force members representing different uh, sectors of the community, community leaders, business leaders, elected leaders. Um, uh, was built on a lens of racial equity and uh, taking uh, action on climate, um, and absolutely recognizing the decades of disinvestment that communities of color uh, that that the communities of color have seen here in the Portland metro area. Uh, in its totality, the measure invests in 17 different corridors. Um, if you see the map that we that we put together to illustrate the impact of this, it's truly a beautiful regional uh, uh, investment package. Um, and a lot of the priorities that we see in this uh, go to, like I mentioned, corridors where prim primarily BIPOC communities live. Uh, in my district, uh, in the place that I grew up, we have TB Highway, which is uh, about 17 mile road. Uh, it, is an, it, it is a state highway uh, and what we call here locally an orphan highway. And the reason I bring this up is because it's a really clear example of how as the Portland metro area has grown over decades, these roads were initially built to be, you know, getting farm markets, uh, getting farm products to markets. Um, and in this time, our communities have suburbanized and now urbanized. 
and the roads aren't meeting the needs of people. So we're, we're, we're going to be prioritizing safety. We're building our region's first bus rapid transit lines. We're continuing to build out our MAX network, but we're also investing in programs like a free youth pass, uh, a free youth transit pass for, for everyone under the age of 18 in the Portland metro area to have access to, to free transit. And that is a huge goal that our youth had in our region, very, very clear about the barriers and wanting to remove that. Uh, a bus electrification program that will make sure that we have the necessary resources to transfer all of our fleet from diesel buses to electric, uh, as well as really important programs like safe routes to school. Um, and uh, um, uh, like I said, just investments that our region can be really proud of. Uh, I, I'll, I'm really excited to talk a little bit more about the different elements of the packages we get going. But again, you can always learn more at letsgetmoving2020.com. Um, in the moment, obviously, we have a, a, a huge challenge with the coronavirus pandemic and the recession that we're facing. But uh, this package is going to help us create over 37,000 jobs here in the Portland metro area. And that's a number that we're really proud of. These are living wage trade jobs that are going to be sustainable for the life of this package and, and into the future. Um, so what, what more can I say than, than let's get moving. There you go. And Kelsey, uh, here, here in Washington, what is the measure that's on the ballot for transit? Great. Hi again, I'm Kelsey. I'm advocacy director at transportation choices, working with Alex. Um, so locally, we have a Yes for Transit campaign for Seattle Proposition 1. This is a renewal and modification of an existing taxing district, um, the Seattle Transportation Benefit District, or as we use affectionately call it, the STBD. Um, a, it was approved by voters initially in 2014 and expires this year. Um, so the replacement would raise $40 million approximately within the city of Seattle, allowing the city to purchase 150,000 additional bus service hours um, from the county provider, which is King County Metro. It would also fund, continue to fund affordability programs um, for essential workers, for seniors, people with low incomes, uh, living in um, affordable housing and free passes for public high school students. It also includes um, some money for capital transit improvements. Um, the current measure has that's expiring has really allowed Seattle to um, lead the nation in transit ridership as other cities have seen declines. Seattle has seen increases in ridership. Um, I think one uh, measure that really shows this is the um, portion of households that now live within a 10 minute walk of frequent transit. Um, when the measure was first passed, um, a quarter of Seattle households could walk to frequent transit. And now that number is about 70%. So really a huge jump um, in the last six years, all due to this tax. Um, and it's paid off. People love transit here. People really love King County Metro. All of our uh, polling has showed that. So that's been really um, positive this uh, campaign season. Um, and then just a few details about the, the tax itself. It's We're calling it a renew and modification because um, the, the measure on the ballot would be a 0.15% sales tax, um, but it's replacing a 0.1% sales tax and $60 vehicle licensing fee. Um, I'm sure many, many of you here know last year there was a statewide initiative in Washington, I-976, um, that passed at the ballot. It limited the use of the vehicle licensing fees to $30. Um, and so while uh, stakeholders, including the city of Seattle, were fighting, uh, fighting that battle in the courts this year, um, you know, when, when the time came to put the renewal measure on the ballot, um, it was not an option here. So there was a, a lot of debate about um, what to do with just sales tax as an option. Um, should we do one, you know, 0.15 or this, the city's limit of 0.2% so we could try to make up as much of that funding as possible? Um, we ended at 0.15%. So again, that raises about $40 million a year. The expiring um, district was raising about $50 million a year. So it's not quite as much, but um, you know, with we want to acknowledge the regressivity of sales tax. Um, that was you know, a hard choice and that you know, 
obviously this measure, it's really important to keep bus service running. Um, so that was the hard choice we're making this year. Yeah, the, the funding piece, this, this series is called uh, transportation funding is transportation equity. Um, and I think one of the things that I have found the most fascinating in preparing for this is learning more about the tools and limitations that each of our communities are facing as we try to adequately fund um, transit and transportation. So each of us have very vastly different tools available to us between um, sales tax, income tax, property taxes, vehicle license fees, uh, and payroll taxes. Uh, not each of these tools is available to each of us, and each of us has a different kind of threshold that we need to meet when we're putting these kinds of measures before voters. So um, we'll start again with Adina down in California. Can you talk us through what kind of funding mechanisms are available for transit and transportation in California? And what is the threshold that you have to meet in order to pass uh, a, a voter approved tax measure? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll start with this threshold because this is distinctive in California because of Prop 13 that was passed in the 70s. We have a two thirds hurdle to uh, pass a tax and two thirds is always uh, difficult. In terms of the funding mechanisms that are available, um, uh, Caltrain didn't have the ability to put a tax on the ballot. The taxing authority is its member agencies, it's a joint powers authority. And so the bill um, SB 797 that passed in 2017 was for a one eighth percent sales tax. Um, and, um, you know, as I said before, we were not thrilled at. Uh, that, that it was a sales tax and there's a growing movement to have more progressive revenue mechanisms. Um, at that time in 2017, um, though there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, ad advocacy to change that law as it was going through in the state uh, at the Capitol. And so right now um, in, in COVID with the risk of shutdown, this is what we have. If something was in Sacramento now, we would be pushing to have something um, more progressive. But Friends of Caltrain has been working with other transit advocacy and active transportation and environmental and labor groups um, at a regional level. Um, be, uh, back in, in 2019, many years ago, um, the, there was an effort towards having a regional ballot measure, which is going to come back. And that coalition was working on the potential to have more progressive um, funding sources, including the potential of a millionaire's tax, a parcel tax, head tax on large corporations, parking tax. We've got some foundation funding to do studies on the fact that those um, more progressive revenue mechanisms would be viable. And so we're gonna come back again wanting to do that. Part of the challenge is that historically, Ballot measures have been funded by the business community, and the business community has not really been thrilled about business taxes, And um, but there's a, a coalition that is going to work in the future to have more a more progressive funding mix. Uh, Juan Carlos, can you talk about the funding uh, tools and thresholds in Oregon? Absolutely. And I mean, I think that this is going to be a really similar theme across all of our states that the tools are often inadequate and um, and as transportation projects get more expensive or the dollars that we are able to raise, um, we have to stretch those more and more. In Oregon, we have um, a, a really high level of restriction, which is the highway trust fund. Uh, us means that uh, in dollars generated on transportation related sources can only be spent on capital infrastructure. So this is a gas tax. Uh, we don't have any, any specific tolling projects in Oregon, but if we did, dollars would have to be spent um, on infrastructure. And historically, uh, our state legislature has prioritized highway expansions and, and highway investments. Um, and obviously here in the Portland metro area, we have you know, the history of being mavericks in terms of you know, finding innovative ways to, to, to use that, 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 um, that kind of constitutional directive and finding ways to invest that in capital infrastructure and transit um, and trying to find ways to justify the right of way and all of that. 
Um, so first and foremost, I think it's really important to acknowledge that. Um, in terms of how our region funds, uh, our region and our local governments fund uh, public transit, I mean, there's everything from, from gas tax uh, to, to uh, payroll tax, TriMet, which is our, our metropolitan transit service. Uh, they're able to fund um, their transit service through a, a, a region-wide, district-wide employer tax, um, as well as, uh, and, and there's been a lot of, of work with the state legislature to increase and grant authority to do that. Um, and, and I'll talk after some of these explanations about how we're funding Get Moving. Um, but uh, the city of Portland has a 10 cent gas tax, which was renewed this May, uh, can only fund basic transportation safety and maintenance needs. We have uh, local transportation improvement programs that uh, levy off of uh, 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 property taxes and, and help local jurisdictions do capital improvements. But um, every local jurisdiction is really facing a lot of challenges. And so when, when we looked at the opportunity to craft this, this package together in the Portland metro area, you know, we looked at the, at the list of things that we had. Uh, we had a potential corporate activity tax, uh, property tax, I mean, everything under the sun that you can imagine, sales tax, et cetera. But it became really clear that a lot of those things were not feasible for us. Uh, Oregon has no sales tax. And, you know, mentioning the sales tax is one of the worst things that you could possibly do as an elected official here. Um, a payroll tax uh, has been uh, really uh, capped out in recent years with a lot of local initiatives like our affordable housing bond, investments in conservation and open space, which are super important. And so uh, the options that we had were really limited. Um, we have a constitutional, uh, we have legislative authority, my apologies, uh, to levy taxes on income and profits, but we capped those out earlier this year on a historic supportive housing homeless services measure. Um, and so we were really left with, with uh, two options, a vehicle registration fee uh, and, a, and a payroll tax on employers. Uh, our community partners let us know that uh, a vehicle registration fee was incredibly regressive, especially to communities that depend on automobile transit. And so the, the conversation ultimately resulted in us uh, proposing a payroll tax on employers, which is an employer tax, not a wage tax. Um, at uh, for a maximum authority of 0.75%, but we are delaying collection of that until 2022, recognizing the economic downturn. And then also we've worked with the business community to establish a, a sliding increase uh, from 0.6 to 0.75, that max amount uh, to 2026. Anyway, um, uh, how do we create more sustainable funding? I think we have to make sure it's indexed to, for, for the growing costs of inflation of different materials. And I think we all need those diversified revenue sources to make sure that we can meet that need. Um, although this measure is raising $5 billion, which would be hands down the biggest single investment that this region has ever made, it's kind of on par with um, you know, maybe uh, things that the state has done in general. Just to put it into perspective, since we are uh, obviously significantly smaller than California and, and, and Washington, it's, it's a big step for us. And um, um, what, what I feel like we have right now is really a, a you know, fight for the future of the region and what kind of infrastructure projects we want to be investing in. Um, and, and we're doing our best to, to, to carry this, this, this package created by the people and for the people. Um, instead of, you know, just to continue to facilitate capitalism and, and whatnot. So um, I think I'll leave it there. Uh, this is a, a, an aspect I get really passionate about. I can feel it. I can feel it. I believe in it. <laughs> um, Latina and Juan Carlos, you both talked about the tools that you have available to you and referenced like what what would possibly make it better, new resources, um, interesting ideas like indexing and definitely talking in around community engagement. So, so Kazi, tell us about what's available for transit funding, um, uh, what, what, what this measure has in it, and, and overall, what kind of changes would be suggested for making transit um, funding more sustainable, progressive, and importantly, adequate? Yeah, definitely feel some themes going on, which is that I think, you know, in Washington, we feel like our tools are limited and inadequate and regressive. Um, and, you know, I'm sure many of you know, you know, Washington is, despite its progressive voter base, 
voter base has one of the most regressive tax systems in the country. Um, we have no income tax here. And so transit and many other important issues um, rely on taxes and fees, uh, many of them uh, raised locally. Um, so for transit, you know, we, we do rely very heavily on sales tax, on property tax, um, historically in Seattle and on vehicle licensing fees um, and fair revenue. And um, most of it is raised locally. About 87% of transit funding in Washington is local. Um, about two to 3% comes from the state and 11% is federal funding. So um, really going back to the ballot a lot over and over again, um, asking voters to support transit. Um, you know, at the state, uh, we have you know similar challenges um, as other states, as Juan Carlos mentioned. Um, you know, we have a restrictions on our gas tax funding dating back to the 1940s. So our gas tax um, can only be spent for highway purposes, and historically has has not ever been spent on transit. Um, and so, you know, our options our options are limited. And so, beating the drum of how do we raise new progressive, sustainable, and resilient funding um, is, is what we are doing right now. Um, I think one of the more, I mean, it's challenging, but more promising kind of avenues is the idea of pricing. Um, this conversation is going on on a couple different levels. Um, the state has been for several years exploring the possibility of a road usage charge um, as you know we see gas tax revenues decline um, you know we are asking could this be a progressive pricing structure could a road usage charge um, control for other externalities such as pollution um, could you charge more for polluting vehicles or more in if you are driving through a, an environmental you know justice sensitive area um, and then, you know, could the funds from a road usage charge be flexible and be really be spent um, on a 21st century transportation system for the future rather than, um, you know, on highways only. Uh, locally in Seattle, you know, we've talked about um, a potential congestion pricing policy or other pricing mechanisms um, that could raise money for transit. Um, and could, again, same questions, could that be set up to be a progressive pricing structure, what could set-asides be so that it could be equitable, um, a lot of complicated policy questions, but I think pricing has been, um, is a promising and interesting uh, source that we are pursuing. I think we'd also really like to see the state take a larger role in supporting transit operations, um, you know, thinking about transit as a basic need for our transportation system. I think um, during COVID, we've all seen that you know, our economies are depending on transit um, and a lot of our essential workers are relying on transit to get to jobs that, to stock our grocery shelves, to give us medical care, um, that really, you know, as much as we see roads and highways as an, an essential part of our transportation system, to, transit operations um, should be supported by the state in that way as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really great segue into our next um, set of questions which are about uh, racial equity and, and um, this question of um, who is transit for and how can it uh, better serve people's needs. So Adina, um, how does Measure RR center and advance racial equity through the in thinking about the development of the policy itself, the coalition that you're building, as well as the outcomes of, um, uh, of of the measure passing, the, res the results of what it'll fund. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I, I wanna uh, start with, um, so, so Cal uh, uh, Caltrain, its, its history is, um, was a, you know, as a commuter rail system and commuter rail is fundamentally a segregationist concept. The idea that you have this single purpose piece of a public transportation system that takes affluent suburbanites into their job in the city and back home. And it doesn't connect to any other parts of the transit system because it's expected that the people using it are not gonna use any other kind of transit. 
And, you know, over the last 50 to 60 years, regions around the world have evolved things that started as a commuter rail into more of a regional rail service, which is a component of a regional transit system that is better connected, that is more affordable. And um, that is the advocacy that we've been doing for years. Um, uh, first of all, just to try to elevate the concept that there was something wrong. So when I started working on the advocacy on this and working with people with the transit justice orientation, they would tell me, well, our people are never going to use Caltrain. So like, why would I even care or support this? And you would hear from board members and senior managers saying, well, low income people like buses and high income people like trains and that's the way it is. And, you know, it doesn't need to be different. And um, we worked on getting research showing that there were, you know, disproportion in terms of who got a uh, public transit benefits and higher income workers were more likely to get benefits and lower income workers didn't. And we advocated to get the fair system studied that really showed that there were uh, the, the fair structures upside down and, and higher in, high, the highest income tier paid the least for fares and the lowest income riders um, you know, pay the most for fares is backwards. And so as part of this um, business plan um, uh, with a set of, of partners, including, uh, you know, uh, labor groups and transportation uh, justice groups, um, and um, uh, we had advocated for the equity study to be done and to have the Caltrain develop an equity policy and and programs and that and and that those things happened and what they concluded was not it was not only about fares and during COVID Cal, uh, the, the Bay Area region is starting a means based fare program and Caltrain entered at a 50 percent discount that would be continued by the tax. But also um, what they found that and 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 they you know they have a resolve now to fix its its fair policy internally, but they also found that a key piece for equity is connectivity because low income people and people of color are much more likely to want to connect to the regional transit from the local. And so having integrated fares and integrated schedules is essential towards providing that um, equitable access, as well as you know paying close attention to what neighborhoods and communities people need to get to the train from and making sure that that service is good in terms of transit and active transportation. And those are all elements of the equity policy that was approved by the board and will be funded and helped to implement by uh, Measure RR, um, including identifying the, the an advocacy, um, the Citizens Advisory Committee that will be a key element in reviewing the implementation of the plan, which is going to be really important to have diversity in who is on that Citizens Advisory Committee, um, as well as really unprecedented diverse outreach that was done in building this plan and that will need to continue. So um, uh, hopefully that, that addresses some of the elements in your question. Yeah, thank you, Juan Carlos. Um, Great, I found the unmute button. Um, yeah, well, um, I'll try and be um, uh, short with my answer. I think that I tried to really emphasize how this me measure aims to build on the racial equity uh, investments and strategies that we're advancing here in the greater Portland area. Um, the top highlights of what I want to uh, of what I want to mention are again we had a two year long process that put community uh, communities of color and leaders of color in decision making roles. Um, more than sixty percent of the transit investments of this measure of the five billion dollars are in areas where people of color live. Uh, approximately seventy seven percent of the hundreds of lives that this measure is estimated to save from pedestrian safety uh, or, or lack of safety issues are likely to be lives of people of color. Uh, we, in this, in this measure, we are elevating uh, contracting and workforce requirements for BIPOC communities. They're the strongest requirements that our, our state and our region have ever seen. So we have very aspirational goals built into that. Um, we have uh, carved out anti-displacement investments that include community stability uh, for both residential and commercial. Um, uh, stability, uh, affordable housing, et cetera. 
Um, and every single project in this measure will have 2% of their project funds dedicated to anti-displacement. So an example of that is TV Highway is slated to receive $550 million from this measure to do a treatment that builds the bus rapid transit lane, et cetera. 2% of those dollars will be dedicated to anti-displacement uh, initiatives. And that's really a standard that uh, we haven't seen happen uh, very much around the country. And we, we feel really uh, excited about that kind of precedent setting. Um, and lastly, um, increasing our BIPOC uh, uh, community-based organization's ability to engage in the, plan, in the plan implementation and to really hold us accountable to the high level values that we crafted in the measure. Yeah, I'm so curious. I can't wait to like follow up and learn more about the anti-displacement measures, right? We, I think we all know that transit, especially capital investment projects have um, had a historically inherent uh, displacement element to them. And so I think that that's amazing. I can't wait to learn more about it. Um, yeah, Kelsey, how, how does the transit measure here in Seattle center an advance, uh, an advanced racial equity? Yeah, well, I think, you know, I normally don't like saying transit funding is transit is doing the work of transit equity, but I think um, in some ways, you know, it is, it really is, um, you know, as we mentioned, because of COVID, we've really seen, um, you know, which trans, who is still riding transit and which routes are still really popular. Um, and, you know, in Seattle, um, we've seen that communities, routes through communities of color have ridership has remained really high. And so, um, you know, renewing the funding and just keeping the buses running is incredibly important for racial equity. Um, but I think there's been some other elements of the Seattle Transportation Benefit District that over, you know, the lifetime of the initial measure um, have changed and have been kind of interesting. Um, Seattle, the Seattle DOT does use adopted race and social justice policy to guide its decision making. Um, and so, you know, 70% of funds from the current measure have been invested in increasing service hours outside of peak periods. So making sure, you know, students, families, people with non-traditional work hours or working the night shift um, have access to that frequent service. Another policy change that was made a couple years ago was to change what qualify, which routes qualify for funding. So initially a route had to be 80% within the city to qualify for these funds. Um, council changed that to 65% of the route, which means that routes that are coming into Seattle from the suburbs um, are, can now be funded using, this, using these dollars. Um, this is important for racial equity because there's been as I'm in the Bay Area, as in Portland, displacement from the city, um, a lot in, primarily in communities of color. And so P, uh, POC are, you know, being forced out into the suburbs, but obviously still have, you know, their lives centering here in the city. And so making sure we are providing adequate bus or transit service um, from the suburbs into the city is, is a really important racial equity piece as well. Um, again, there's you know, program dollars for um, low-income pass programs. Um, and then you know, another interesting thing that um, the Seattle DOT and King County Metro have done recently is to put together um, community-based advisory boards um, to advise on equity um, in policy making and service planning. And so um, you know, as I think things change over, you know. We, we know a lot is unknown about the future, but I think um, if, if, the pass, if the measure is passed, um, those equity boards will continue to play an advisory role in how the funds are spent. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we talked about the development, you know, what is in these measures, the development of them, and, and uh, what are the sort of principles and values um, that, that they are trying to advance. Um, so let's pivot a little bit to talk about the campaigns themselves, the public conversation. Um, Adina, I'll, I'll start with you. And but uh, questions that I, I have here is like, so what are the messages that you're using when you're doing your outward facing campaign? Um, and also, do you have any opposition and how are they talking about this, uh, the measures in your communities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm gonna um, start about the opposition because that's gonna be really short. 
Um, there is, you know, essentially no funded opposition. There's a few people that are like hardcore conservatives and don't believe in any taxes, but they are not organized. They are not running a no campaign. And in doing the phone banking, um, you know, we get bunches of yeses from Republicans. There are some Republicans in the Bay Area and, uh, you know, the, the ones that we call have been um, saying yes. Um, in terms of the messaging and the campaign, um, uh, one really interesting thing about our our campaign is that there is a um, you know big funded campaign um, you know with funding from the business community that's running ads and doing mailers and so on, and we ha then have the uh, grassroots um, organizations, um, transit advocacy groups, active transportation, housing groups. Um, working together to do the grassroots outreach, the phone banking, the text banking, um, and, and other peer-to-peer -peer voter outreach. Um, this is built on some work that we did on a county-level ballot measure a couple of years ago, um, where the grassroots did the grassroots arm of the campaign for a measure that passed by 500 votes. And um, and so that that model is what we're doing here. And so the messages for the campaign overall to reach the voter are about um, congestion relief. It's about um, keeping pollution out of the air. As, you know, people are sensitive to that with the wildfires and the horrible pollution um, and, uh, you know, that economic recovery and accountability. So um, that that people, you know, there's there's some features that say that this money will go for the purposes that it's intended. Um, in doing the grassroots outreach, I'm doing a lot of outreach to the people who are going to be volunteering for the phone banking and the text banking. And so the message to my people who are the volunteers are we are not going to be able to build housing and affordable housing in this area if our transit backbone collapses. We'll, um, you know, we, we absolutely need Caltrain as a part of a public transportation system. Um, to be able to um, achieve our environmental goals and have people live with fewer cars. And um, this is funding um, uh, equity provisions that will make Caltrain more accessible. And those are the things, those are the messages that motivate my volunteers who are then doing the phone banking and the text banking to more diverse, you know, like ordinary voters. Well, I can I can follow up on that. Um, you know, our 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 messaging has been really focused on the contents of the package. I mean, the thing about our 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 measure is that it it is it is truly regional um, in terms of the grid and the investments that we're making. That you know, nearly everyone in the region has uh, really intimate experiences with these roads, with these corridors. And, and how they lack um, in, in everything that we need from them and expect from them, especially as the Portland metro area continues to grow. Um, we, we focus on safety, on, our, on uh, activating our, our leadership for a climate future, um, and of course, the economic impact of recovery and our jobs. Uh, I, I, for, for me, those things can't go unstated. I think people are hungry for infrastructure investments. They want us to build a 21st century system. And that's something that I've really heard from the other panelists on this call. And you know, I, I'm really happy that we're having this conversation because the West Coast, our, our major cities, our major regions, we're really leading the way, I think, for the country and how we build 21st centuries or rebuild our cities to, to address the, the, the challenges and to address um, you know, I think um, the, the things that we see on the horizon um, and trying to be those leaders, make those investments now and gain that competitive advantage for, for, for our economies, for our people, um, and, and people respond very, very well to that. Because uh, before we go to you, Juan Carlos, you want to talk a little bit about your opposition? Yeah, happily. Um, we have a very organized opposition, um, honestly. Uh, it is funded by uh, mostly uh, the biggest corporations in the Portland metro area. Um, this measure I didn't mention earlier, but our taxing mechanism exempts small businesses. So only 9% of our region's businesses would be paying this tax. 91% uh, of our small businesses would be exempt, which is really significant. And so, you know, that 9% is very, very mobilized. Uh, they're attacking our credibility, our transparency, kind of 
you know, the oldest corporate, uh, uh, you know, plays in the playbook. Um, they very clearly taken on Koch brother, you know, anti-transit messaging. Um, and it's just, it's really disappointing because, um, a lot of the, a lot of the business leaders, um, I feel like, um, are, are being pressured to, um, uh, to embrace this kind of language. And for me, I'm just, I, I'm really uh, eager to see how we respond, uh, after this, I think in the Portland Metro area, we've been really, really lucky to have a very collaborative, very tightly knit, uh, jurisdictional partnerships, have, having an organization like Metro that covers 24 cities in three counties, having these regional tables that people want to be at. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, with the times that we're facing, a lot of those things are, are a lot more fragile. So uh, as an elected official, I think for me, it's, it's how do we continue to rebuild that trust with the business community? Because from what we're seeing in the campaigns right now, um, it, it, it feels like things are really frayed. Um, uh, things that they are continuing to, to uh, attack us on is, you know, this measure is not going to do enough for climate. Uh, it's the wrong tax at the wrong time. Kind of the things that we could expect um, from, from kind of the more status quo. Um, but from what I've been able to tell when we're at public debates or virtual community debates, people can see right through that. Um, that, you know, instead of wanting to invest in their local communities that they're beholding to out-of-state shareholders. Um, and people, res people respond. Yeah, there was a really wonderful uh, piece in um, City Lab today from the CEO of the Coalition of Communities of Color, Marcus Mundy, uh, who's based in the Portland area, that I would encourage folks here to, to give a read to the talks about this. Um, Kelsey, what are the messages uh, that are working or that, we're, that you're using in the campaign here and um, what is the extent to which there's any opposition to this measure? Yeah, and the messaging has been pretty straightforward. We've basically been talking about you know, transit is essential and essential workers are riding transit. Um, one in three essential workers in Seattle rides transit. So that is a pretty compelling fact in and of itself. Other messages, fairness, access, equity really resonate with voters in Seattle. Climate has actually pulled among the worst of our messaging, but it was still um, convincing to 73% of people we polled. So basically people love transit and think that it's great. So. Um, hopefully that bodes well for us. Uh, there has not been an organized opposition. Um, you know, messages are about sales tax being regressive, I think are always out there. Um, and then, you know, general sentiment that people aren't riding the bus right now is something we're working against. People are also, I think, wondering why the buses look so empty and not understanding that, um, you know, buses are, ha are having to be more empty because of social distancing requirements. So some kind of just um, kind of contextual beliefs out there, but um, the messages have been pretty clear. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, the, that social distancing requirement on the buses is really real. Um, we used to a joke that it used to be a full bus was like face to strangers armpit like sardines in there and that's definitely not the case for what full means anymore and, and messaging that to people I think is really important. Um, we're closing in in our last couple of minutes so I'm going to turn to questions that we've received from our audience members. So again if you're watching this and you've got questions I know I have many about all the interesting things that have been discussed here, drop them down below. Um, and I know we're really focused on winning in November and it's just it's just right so close, but let's talk a little bit about what's next. So how does your campaign fit into the, the longer term movement for, um, as Kelsey said, a 21st century transit and transportation system for our communities? Um, and, and, and what would kind of be the, the next big thing that gets built off of, off of uh, hopefully uh, a 3-0 th and o win for our communities. And, and I'll start with Adina in California. Uh, a few po points on that. So, so first of all, um, Caltrain is only one service in a whole region where the public transportation system is really hurting and we need to be working at the regional and state and federal level, including hopefully with the folks on this call at the federal level in 
um, bringing in funding that will help the public transit system overall across the U.S. to recover, including some changes at the federal level that have harmed public transportation, including, um, you know, enabling more flexibility and being able to use operating funding and, and um, you know, also maybe having a different balance nationally in terms of how much money can be used for transit versus how much needs to be spent on highways in an era of a climate crisis. Um, uh, certainly regional funding is going to be a big issue in the Bay Area, and there's coalition work that will uh, continue to push for that, including with um, progressive funding sources and also working on making sure that operating funding is a large part of the pie. Um, we use Seattle as an example of having really gotten that operating funding, which is important for transit to be successful, as opposed to having ribbon cutting disease and having money go to build shiny new things that then the system doesn't have the funding to run. Um, in terms of um, another piece of transformational change that we really need in the Bay Area, we have 27 transit agencies um, that re results in a really disjointed system, um, which is a problem for um, everyone in terms of the convenience of the system and the number of people who use transit and therefore our climate problems in our cities. And it's a big problem in terms of equity and affordability um, uh, you know, particularly for lower income people. And that's a place where in the Seamless Bay Area project, we're working um, with a coalition to, um, you know, promote transformational change there because that will enable the money that we bring in to result in a system that is more convenient and more equitable for everyone. Great, thank you. Uh, Juan Carlos, to you, what, what's next? Well, I mean, I think for us, um, I, I think we have to continue building on each other's successes. I mean, up and down the West Coast, like I've mentioned, I think that leaders, community advocates um, are, are really showing us what bold and you know, visionary policy looks like. And I think that the rest of the country can, can learn from us and, and have some of that courage to, to think, to go to, to, I mean, to go to the people, to go to the ballot and to really secure resources uh, to, to invest in the projects that we need to be doing and to, and to support. Um, I, I also think that, you know, like was just mentioned, um, we also really need to, to stabilize our funding for the nuts and bolts of what people expect. And it, there's a really uh, difficult dynamic here in Oregon uh, based on the restrictions that we have, you know, to be able to balance those things. But um, uh, I think that in general, um, you know, we need to be moving away from fossil fuel infrastructure. That's something that uh, leaders in the Portland metro area have been have tried to be very clear about at the state level. Um, uh, I think that other other cities and other regions across the country, um, maybe not so much the West Coast, but uh, around the country are starting to recognize that you can't continue to invest in fossil fuel infrastructure in light of a climate crisis. But I think it's no secret that we need to continue to build a political will around that because I think our American culture, our customs, our behaviors are so tied to the car um, and it's not by accident and, and redefining that. Um, I'm also really proud of, of this measure and how we put it together. I think it, it's a playbook for how other local governments should be putting measures together in terms of uh, uh, creating decision-making opportunities uh, for, for BIPOC leaders and really uh, uh, investing in BIPOC organizations to help build the framework as well. Um, I, I think that these community partnerships are gonna be really important. And again, just thank you so much for uh, giving us the opportunity to, to learn about um, the work happening in California and in Oregon and Washington. And um, I, I just really appreciate that. Kelsey, what's, what's next? Ooh, so much to do. I mean, I think, you know, as it relates to the transportation benefit district measure, um, you know, eventually we would like to return to a countywide approach to funding transit here in the Seattle area. Um, although the Seattle, Seattle has benefited greatly from this taxing district, 
um, we know that the rest of the county is experiencing less service. And what we really want to do is look more holistically at funding bus service in the future. We were very close to putting a county measure on the ballot this year. Then COVID happened, so that's where we are. But I think that's one big thing. Um, we'll be wanting to make sure that that is coordinated and integrated with the build out of our major infra capital infrastructure package, Sound Transit 3, which is building light rail um, out across our region. A ton of stations coming online in the next few years, and we need to make sure people can get there on bus, on bike, on foot safely. Um, so we are moving away from our car dependency. Um, and then I think just continuing to talk about funding. The, you know, the passage of Initiative 976 last year was really devastating, but it did open up a door to talk a lot more um, honestly about how we're funding transit and transportation. Um, and so that has been positive. Uh, somebody did comment that the Supreme Court um, struck down the initiative last week. So that's very exciting, but also raises a lot more questions about what's going to happen next. Um, but I think, yes, continuing to yeah, build the coalition, environment, labor, business, build a coalition for um, funding transportation type of transportation that we need to carry us into a, a better future. Great, and we have one minute left. I wanna make sure, so lightning round, um, how can folks get involved in the success of your measures in these really critical final two weeks before the election? Uh, we'll go California, Oregon, Washington. Um, all, right, all right, so I don't know how many Californians there are on here or how much um, you know, saving Caltrain is essential piece of our regional transportation system is, um, uh, relevant to folks on this call, um, but the website for the campaign was posted. The link I just put in is for the grassroots activities um, for the phone banks and a pledge card, which connect you to um, text banks and other peer-to-peer -peer voter outreach that um, you can do. So those are that link is a thing that you can do. So please um, sign up if you are in California or you are interested in saving an important slice of the public transportation system. Awesome. And uh, for us here in the Portland metro area, I put I put it in the chat box as well. Uh, we're doing virtual phone banks almost daily, uh, uh, text banks, uh, really so many ways that you can get involved. Uh, you can, of course, donate and make sure that we can go up against the, uh, the corporate bullies that want to tell us that now is not the right time. And you can stay in the loop at letsgetmoving2020.com. Uh, thanks again for tuning in and uh, let's get moving. Yep, similarly, we're hitting the phone banks. Um, TCC is phone banking tonight, so you can uh, join us. Um, but there's phone banks every day up until the election. And then I would say, tell your networks to please don't get ballot fatigue and vote all the way down the ballot. Um, proposition one is the very last thing. If you're a Seattle voter, you gotta get through a lot of King County amendment, charter amendments um, and advisory votes. So please vote all the way down your ballot. Um, and thank you. Same here. Vote the whole ballot. Yeah, up and down. Um, thank you all. This has been so amazing. Um, I'm just so inspired by all the work that's happening. I feel the synergy and the excitement and the passion and the energy, even through my computer screen. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our attendees. Stay tuned. Next time we're going to be talking about road pricing. Um, you can follow Transportation Choices and, and learn more about all of the work that we're doing as well as our partners here. So thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Thanks. Good luck.